with you today, Dan. What a treat we have in store for us. You are the author of the much, much acclaimed book, A Banker's Journey, a biography of Edmund J. Safra and how he built such a vast financial empire across three continents, four big institutions, uh, and led such a colourful um, life. Um, this is a very substantive, very researched, beautifully written book that I've learned a huge amount about, not only about leadership, which we'll talk about today, but also his community, um, the Sephardic Jew community, um, and has plenty of insights for strategic leaders. Uh, and that's obviously we're gonna, gonna, what we're going to focus on today. Um, in previous lives, you've been a columnist for the Economic View uh, in the New York Times, and of course, Slate's Moneybox columnist, amongst many other uh, roles. And you are most, most welcome, Dan. David, it's a pleasure to be here, and I feel like, you know, given what you've already said, we can just stop here, and and that's uh, sufficient promotion. <laughs> Very good. You're not getting off that easily. So, um, but before we delve into some of the the lessons uh, for other other leaders and other entrepreneurs, um, let's uh, let's let's paint the picture of of the man. And indeed, this is the first episode in Lancefield on the Line where we're actually talking about an individual. So I'm really excited about it, and obviously excited to talk to you. But before we delve in, paint the picture of who he was, um, uh, and also very importantly, what drew you to him. So Edmund Safra was a banker in the second half of the 20th century. He was born in 1932 in Beirut to a multi-generational banking family. They were like a kind of the Safras were like a mini Rothschilds of the Middle East. He was sent to Milan at the age of 15 in 1947 to start trading. And over the course of the next 50 years, uh, he went to Brazil in his 20s, started a financial institution there. He went to Geneva in his late 20s, started a private Swiss bank. He went to New York in 1964, founded Republic Bank, which grew from a startup into the 11th largest bank in the United States. So he had assembled personally, essentially, a global financial empire. Um, his main banks were publicly held. Their stocks notched 20% compounded returns over a period of 20 to 25 years. Um, he almost never had a credit loss. He had a view of banking that was sort of upside down from the way the money center banks um, manage this. So he was both an heir to a old world banking fortune and an entrepreneur. Um, and in addition, along the way, he was a kind of one man supporter of the Syrian and Lebanese Jewish diaspora, right? The European Jewish communities were disrupted in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. The um, Jewish communities of the Middle East, that displacement came in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And as these communities sort of blew up, anywhere they were starting to form a new synagogue in their diaspora in Brazil, in New York, in Europe, form a community center, they went to him. He was the sort of single institutional support for this community, going so far as to ransom the, the last 4,000 Jews out of Syria in 1994. Um, so I write for this community, he was kind of like a, a Rothschild, a Buffett, and an Oscar Schindler wound into one person. Uh, so he had this fascinating career. Uh, the business side, I think, is as interesting as the sort of personal and philanthropic side. And they were all, it was all very much tied together. His vision of what a banker was supposed to do, namely protect your depositors, uh, went back to their family's roots in Beirut and Aleppo in a world without deposit insurance, without a central bank, without bailouts. And that mentality somehow formed what he did. And you would think that would be a, um, a measure for being conservative in your business outlook. But this guy went around the world and literally created from scratch, bank after bank after bank. He sold his two banks in 1999 to HSBC for $10 billion in cash, which was the highest price paid to date uh, for an American bank in cash. That was when $10 billion was still a lot of money. His personal component of that was $3 billion, and he was going to start at the age of 67, even though he was afflicted with Parkinson's, he was going to start another asset management firm when he died in 1999. Wow, well, I am, that is breathtaking, and what a brilliant <laughs> summary. Awesome. I mean, that, that's, I mean, you've done too well, Dan, you probably summarized your book too well, but please do go, go and still buy it and read it and, and use it. Um, where do you start? What an inspiring, inspiring individual. And I've come across his name, but I didn't know the story, I'll be, I'll be honest. But clearly, if you look at the quotes um, about the book, that says a lot about you clearly as the author, and also his network, both in business terms and also in philanthropy. Um, 
gosh, unless he started very young. That's one thing that really struck me. Um, and as far as you can tell, where 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 did that come from? That that question of nature nurture was that a uh, him was it a necessity? Was it uh, an entrepreneurial spirit inherited? Where did that come from? Because it was quite remarkable. He was doing things right. at sixteen that, frankly, I definitely wasn't doing at that age. Certainly. Well, you know, you have to go back and cast your mind. You know, this book to me, the fascinating part is the sort of meeting of the old world and the new world, in which he embodied this as a person. Um, his family had been in Aleppo, Syria where had been, there had been a Jewish community since you know, the time of the Bible, literally uh, uninterrupted presence. The Safras were a prominent merchant and financing family. Edmund Safra's father, after the demise of the Ottoman Empire, went to Beirut, which was sort of on the up and up in 1920 and started a bank there. Look, in that world, every business was a family business. Your last name was often your trade, right? If you think people were named Smith or Cooper, like the equivalent of that in Arabic, that people were named slaughterers or people who traded in golds, etc. So, you know, and t to some degree, it was a simpler time when you didn't ask a question about what it is you were going to do with your life. You were born to go into the business or the trade that your parents and your family was in. Right. And his family happened to be in the banking business. Uh, so he was going around with his father at the age of nine or 10 to the bazaar, and his father taught him how to you assess someone's credit worthiness by looking them in the eye. Yes. Uh, his formal education, you know, went to sort of private schools in Beirut at the time. You got your baccalaureate degree at the age of 14 or 15 and went to work. That was par for the course. What was not par for the course was that his father in 1947, things are starting to get a little dicey in Beirut, um, in Lebanon, and says, we need a, a beachhead for the family somewhere else. And so he sends him with a 19-year-old chaperone to Milan. Now, waiting for him there was an account with a million dollars in cash, connections to banking networks that already existed. But he basically went around Europe as a 16-year-old buying gold, which was not traded freely. There was no point in buying gold in Europe. Bretton Woods fixed it at $35 an ounce. Yes. But if you knew how to move it to Kuwait or India or Hong Kong, it traded freely there. And so at the age of 16 and 17, he was running around Paris, Amsterdam, Zurich, buying gold, sending it uh, into his family's network uh, to the Far East. Oh, so to, to answer your question, a lot of it was nurtured. It was clear from when he was a yes. child. But, you know, there were four brothers. And typically in that world, the oldest son is the one who carries on the business. Edmund was the second youngest, uh, second oldest. There was an older brother who decided he didn't really want to be in the family business. So his father, even at the age of 14 or 15, had identified um, this boy essentially as the one who was going to take the legacy forward. So yes, you know, nature, yes, but in terms of nurture and giving an opportunity, yes, but then still doing what you described with going around Europe, I think selling gold in different countries takes quite something. And one thing, another thing that really struck me reading the book and, and learning about his story was he clearly lived and worked in, I'd say, many continents, um, you know, from, as you say, from Milan to Geneva, you know, Monaco, Lat Lat you know, in his later stages of life, Sao Paulo, New York. What was it about his mindset and personality that enabled him to mix in communities that, frankly, many, many other people with his background may have struggled with. Yeah, well, I think you start with the fact that he grew up in Beirut. Now, Beirut now is seen as a metaphor for, you know, civil war, disorder, non-functionality. In the 1920s, it was a Francophone, you know, French-speaking, cosmopolitan, facing the Mediterranean in Europe, uh, multi-confessional, you know, Christians, Muslim Jews living in harmony, a financial yes. center. So you grew up in that world, you were already kind of, you know, he's, you were speaking French, you were speaking English, you were speaking Arabic, and he sort of knew Hebrew. So was, and any kid basically already knew three languages and was sort of dealing in realms beyond your own context. But what he had a, he had a, you know, I guess his genius was his ability to sort of go somewhere and go straight to the center of the action. You know, people who are migrants or immigrants will often, they'll go and they'll go to the fringes or they'll go to a particular neighborhood and open a shop. When he yeah. went to Sao Paulo in Brazil as a, at the age of 22, he went right to the heart of the commercial center and said, we're going to set up trading firms and started trading coffee and jute bags and importing industrial machinery. Uh, in 1959, he went to Geneva and said, I'm going to start a Swiss licensed bank in Geneva. 
when he came to the U.S., he went literally to the middle of, you know, his bank was at 42nd Street and 5th Avenue, the smack in the middle of the financial district. So part of this was this kind of confidence based on the fact that, you know, he had grown up quite wealthy, knew exactly who he was. Uh, so a confidence to go right to the center of the action. Um, a facility with languages. He was fluent in seven languages. He picked up, you know, That's Portuguese. Remarkable. He picked up Spanish. He picked up Italian. Uh, and a... Um, you know, it was a, a mix of sort of audacity and the idea of like, as a 17 year old, he can knock on the door of the central bank in Paris and say, Hey, I'd like to buy some gold. Like most people <laughs> wouldn't think to do that. Um, and then that was married to a, 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 an ambition, right. That he always wanted more. He wanted to get more clients. He wanted to get more customers. He wanted to be in more areas and an ability to, understand networks. I mean, we talked about, we talk about financial networks, technology networks, and LinkedIn. He was born into, you know, there was a familial network. There was a network of Jews from Aleppo who had dispersed. There were always like a few in Milan, in the Philippines, in Tokyo, in Manchester, where the, you know, the textile trade was. Um, the school that he went to was called the Alliance. It was a network of French speaking Jewish schools that stretched from Morocco to Iran with a training center in Paris. So you were in that world. He was born into the banking network. Um, I had interviewed Jacob Rothschild and Jacob Rothschild, you know, took his bank uh, public in 1972 in London, in which was at the time the largest post-war IPO. And Jacob Rothschild stood up at a prep conference and said, you know, I've known you. My father knew your father. Our grand my grandfather knew your grandfather. So he was born into that network. Um, and so we understood how to use those network and then build them. So he, you know, his MO was to he had this bank in New York that took middle class deposits. And instead of lending to mortgages or credit cards or auto loans, like every other bank, he would go to the central bank of Venezuela and say, I'll lead a syndicate a $50 million loan for you. And by the way, back in those days, central banks, governments always paid back their debts. So he would never have to worry about yes. people paying back their debts. I mean, he in what you describe there, and in the rest of the book, um, he he did he packed more into a day, a week, a month, a year, a lifetime than many many of us, if we if we count ourselves upward, um, in multiple lifetimes. If you get my drift, yeah. um, what what sustained him through through his life? And we may come on to this. I mean, he had some ups and downs professionally and personally, um, but what 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 sustained him? Uh, some of it was obviously ambition. Um, you know, let, let's be honest, he, anybody who comes and becomes a billionaire obviously enjoys like making money and making profits. So, you know, the, the idea that people are just in it to do something else, um, you know, he liked that. He had a large sense of responsibility, which was, you know, came from where he was located in how he came up. In other words, the Safra family was known that they were one of the leading families. And so it was their responsibility to help their community. And he kind of fused that with this idea that, again, what he was there uh, what to do was to protect his depositors, whether they're in Beirut, Geneva, New York. And you know this was the era of what they called the suitcase generation, that people had to have a suitcase packed in case they had to leave on a moment's notice. Yeah. Um, and what you needed to know is that your the assets to the extent you had them would be safe somewhere. And so he felt yeah. that was the overwhelming sort of responsibility of the banker, not just to a generic customer, but to a particular group of customers, Jews who were coming out of Egypt, out of Morocco, out of Lebanon and Syria. And so I think he had that, you know, people talk about what's our business's mission? What is our purpose? We hire consultants, we have focus groups, we do trainings. Um, he never had to have a conversation about that because it was very clear. You were you were there obviously to make money, to finance trade, but also to you know be a, a source of support for your community. Um, and the expression in which he did that was banking, essentially. And how, in terms of his, we would call it now leadership style, but his style of doing business within his organizations, less so with clients. How would you describe that? Because I've I've worked with and known what I call founder chairs, founder CEOs of organisations. Candidly, not not, a, not of his stature, I'll grant you. Um, 
and they often have a very dictatorial, very sort of one, this is my style, this is my way of doing things. And it's frankly fine if you ascribe to it. It can be challenging if you have a different way. <laughs> How would you describe his his own style of leading organizations? Well, you know, I would say aristocratic in some ways. In his universe, in his world, he was, I don't want to say treated as the king, but he was something like that. Now, mm. Republic Bank, which was public, he owned 30% of the stock, common shares. There was no voting shares. Anybody else could buy stock, but it was clear who owned the bank. Um he was never the CEO of the American bank because he, you know, he didn't spend uh, more than a couple months a year in the U.S. But what the people who work for him describe is a, a sort of court. In other words, uh, he, he bought a building in, in midtown Manhattan. Uh, he opened a bank on the ground floor and he lived in the penthouse at the top on the 11th floor. So it's like a you know version of people living across the shop and people would say, at five or six o'clock, you know, he wasn't married till much later in his life. He didn't have children. This was his sort of family. At five or six o'clock, people, you know, a group of people would go up to his office at the top, have a drink, sit around in a circle and talk about what went on that day. And other people might be summoned in to talk about a particular issue or a particular problem. Um, that's clearly not how any multinational would organize itself today. He certainly had a challenge with delegation. His name was you know, sort of on the building, and he felt himself to be the guarantor of all the assets. He always felt that, you know, he was this Lebanese Jewish guy with uh, Brazilian citizenship who lived in Switzerland. If something happened to his bank in New York, the government wouldn't help him at all. Yes, so yes. If you made a bad lending decision, he would get very angry about it. Um, but again, in his world where every business was a family business, the idea that a hired person could actually be the CEO and run it with full authority. That was kind of alien to him. So he really yeah, did so kind of run these banks. He had, you know, certain talented people, but there was a, a limit to how much he was autonomy executive as a chair. And, as, and, as, as, and, and, and this was all done, mind you, before email, before the internet. So he was on the phone and his day was, you know, someone described it as a continuous scroll. He would be, if he was in Europe, he would be up in the morning talking to people in Asia and then as the day dawn, talking to people and then on the phone to New York. Um, so it was, again, I think that is not, you would have said that was not a sustainable way of managing enterprises in the 70s and the 80s on a global basis. Certainly not a sustainable way of doing that, you know, at scale today. Hmm. And you've described his approach to banking, uh, which is certainly different from <laughs> many bankers, particularly that we've seen in um, well, over number, the last few decades, at least, if you look at the crises and some of the more recent behaviour. But if you were, Dan, speaking to a, a CEO of a major bank, and that person was interested in, the, you know, the Safra story, apart from obvious differences, like, as you said, email, telephone, and so forth, although we still can use the telephone in the world of Zoom and so on, what, what lessons would you draw out for a a CEO of a bank now from his experience and his success and impact? Yeah, I would say two things. One is, you know, in business, the great opportunity for value is when you kind of flip the script that you take someone else's liability and you can turn it into an asset and vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. And he had it upside down. He, he felt that the deposits, which are a liability on the balance sheets, that that was an asset and that the loans which everybody regards as an asset, were a liability because he would have to stay awake at night wondering if they were going to get paid back. Mm -hmm. um, that's one. And the second is the sort of orthodoxy that leverage is what gets you returns. If you don't have leverage, if you don't use a lot of leverage, then you're not going to be able to make money. And what he showed, uh, again, is they reported their results quarterly and annually, and people often were mystified there must be something strange about what they're doing because they didn't have very high leverage. They had low leverage and they had, didn't have credit losses. Like you don't have to, his view is you don't have to accept credit losses as part of doing business. And the reason was they did a lot of what we would call banking activities. So they, they traded gold. They were a mm -hmm. depository for gold and silver, which meant you people would put gold in your vault and you could earn interest or lend it out. Uh, they did a huge amount of trade finance, factoring, um, you know, again, you're taking limited types of uh, risks. He loved to make loans that were guaranteed by the Export Import Bank, the World Bank, the IMF, 
that were guaranteed. You know, so what if they paid 4% instead of 5%? If you never had a loan loss, it made it up. Um, so <laughs> they had a very large business in moving banknotes around the world, which is a fee-based business. You think about, you know, you go to Brazil, you change some currency, it all has yes. to sort of come back. That was not a very sexy or interesting um, business for any bank, you know, very limited margins, but it's fee-based. And, you know, if you don't lose the money, you can't lose money doing it. And so he had a bunch of businesses like this that sort of added up to something substantial. Very smart. It's refreshingly refreshing to go against, if you like, what might we might call conventional practice or wisdom. I mean, including yeah. your comments earlier about having to have a big purpose statement, you know, on your website wall or, or talk about it. He knew what his purpose was. Yeah. Uh, and he clearly, if anyone listening to him would have got it, but it, he didn't have to have some big campaign to, to tell everyone, which is refreshingly different. Yeah, and I think, that, and you know, look, he did have these, he would give these interviews and he would give these adages, you know, my father told me uh, if you would, you know, found a, a, a set your ship on the, on the seas of banking to have a, you know, be secure that it can last a flood. Like he would have things like that. Um, yes. you know, make a dollar a day, but make sure you make a dollar a day, which was his idea that you, know, you always hedge when you can. Um, and I think that is the, you know, there are many examples when he personally would go and start just trading for the bank's account based on something that was happening in the gold or the currency markets, but that he wouldn't, you know, if he can make $5 million, great. If there was a prospect of making 10, but having more risk, cut it off because you, A, live to fight mm -hmm. another day, and B, you are not managing this bank for the next five years, which is the sort of average tenure of a CEO, or even the next 20 years. You're managing it infinitely. In 1997, Republic Bank sold a 100-year bond. Right? Given that Meaning, long view, Dan, given that long over. view, and he, 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 you refer to, and I quote, um, he grandly set a goal to build a bank to last a thousand years. And so throughout his philosophy mindset, there's a lot about that, you know, infinite uh, yeah. view on banking. But then his succession planning um, didn't quite match up to that yeah. ambition. And so when you when he sold HSBC, you, you refer in the book to effectively, that was like, you know, selling off, uh, you tell me if it's wrong, selling off the family. It was, it was it's such an ingrained part of him. How, what, what happened with succession planning for him then? Yeah, well, this is where the sort of old world and new world clash, right? Because his banks were publicly held, which means other people could buy shares and mm -hmm. there was uh, pressure to sort of manage for the short term. Um, he didn't, he got married much later in life. You know, the sort of standard thing in his community is your family, uh, a Syrian Jewish man, you get married when you're 28 or 29 to a woman who's 10 years younger than you, you have five or six kids. The boys, the boys only go into the business and that's your succession plan. Um, because he was traveling so much and essentially lived in five different places and didn't really settle down, he got married much later in life in, the, in his 40s uh, to a woman, mm -hmm. Lily Safra, who had her own children from prior marriages. So they did not have their own biological children. Um, so he didn't have someone to groom. His two younger brothers, who he had set up in Brazil, uh, built their own bank called Banco Safra, which became a, ultimately became a bigger enterprise than what he had, and it wasn't commonly owned. Um, in the 90s, he got Parkinson's disease at, in his early 60s and gets increasingly sort of debilitated over the years. Um, and so he didn't have a succession plan. His succession plan was uh, initially maybe he could work something out with his brothers whereby they you know, might pull their resources or one of them would come and run it. Um, but that didn't work because... They had their own very large enterprise to run. And we're talking like the late 90s here. You can't just sort of graft someone on. And so that, that realization in 1998, again, when he's increasingly debilitated by Parkinson's, can't figure out um, a succession plan, the idea of sort of promoting someone or the existing CEO to say, you know what, you run it and I'll just sort of step back totally alien to his thinking. Yes, yes. And so he regrettably concludes that he has to sell the banks and which he does in May 99. And again, it's a $10 billion deal. And, you know, in a classic American success story, this is the culmination. Someone starts, they're an immigrant, they start a mm -hmm. business, they run it, they build it, and they sell it and right off into the sunset. Um, for him, though, it was a tragedy when a, a friend came from Geneva to congratulate him. 
he said, uh, je vendu mes enfants, which means, you know, I sold my children. I sold yes. my babies in French. And that was very much that feeling that he had. Remarkable. I mean, at the moment, or at least in the last few years, there's a greater emphasis on uh, leaders and CEOs and chairs having a more integrated life, not having a perfect life, but having a professional life that allows for family, friends, hobbies, other activities. And you referred to there, Dan, that obviously he got married later in life. He had a difficult relationship with his brothers. Um, he was highly superstitious. I just mentioned that. He just had fascinating different aspects of his life. Um, and then obviously his, his um, un, untimely death and the circumstances around that. Um, what are your reflections on, if you like, the significant personal success and the, sorry, professional success and I wouldn't, I'm not referring to personal failures, absolutely not. But the, if you like the complexity and the color, is it a quid pro quo in terms of the, 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 so. the life I mean, he led professionally? You know, we talk about, assuming? Yeah, work-life balance. I mean, for him, there really wasn't work-life balance. But part of that was because, A, he enjoyed his work so much. Mm. B, there was this connection where the, there was a family business. So when he's talking to his brothers every day, is that your family life or is that your business life? Yes, indeed. It's actually both. And he saw his customers, his clients, his employees as sort of part of his family. He had many other interests. He collected art. He was always going to auctions. He and his, they had a tremendous portfolio of real estate, including a you know villa in the south of France, apartments in New York, um, Paris, London, Geneva. They had a very active social life and his philanthropic work, which we haven't spoken about much, um, which gave him immense satisfaction, which was very much connected to sort of who he was as a, as a, as a Jewish person. Um, he spent a lot of time, uh, you know, writing checks to people, going to synagogues, going to family events, uh, weddings, bar mitzvahs, like he relished, you know, the, the photos are replete of that. So it's not as if he was someone who was at his office 24 seven. And that was the totality of his life. I think in his case, there was a sort of seamlessness between, you know, boundaries, like we, we like to put sort of boundaries, you know, no, yeah. Yeah. you can't email me on the weekend about work, right? We don't do that anymore. On Sunday, he would call people and sort of ask, you know, what is this customer doing? What is that? What is this guy doing? And the response was, they're not doing anything. It's Sunday. Uh, so <laughs> And you mentioned, I mean, you've you described it there, but his charitable work, his philanthropic work was um, very, very substantial and an integral part of his life, uh, I mean, throughout. Tell me, tell me a bit more about what, yeah, it started, what, what know, led that to him. It goes what, back what, to that... Aleppo and Beirut where there were these formal community councils and organizations to do specific things like feed the hungry or provide a dowry for a woman who didn't have a dowry. Um, when people start to leave Aleppo and Beirut, those get blown up. And he essentially was sort of a one-man operation. So I found in the archives, you know, I had access to his family and personal archives, which had tens of thousands of letters and documents going back 50, 60 years in seven or eight different languages. Um, you know, someone's getting married, he writes them a check. Um, a synagogue in Milan needs new prayer books, he writes them a check. There was a small synagogue in the island of Rhodes where the community had been decimated by the Holocaust. Every year, $500 check so they could have a cantor come and do the high holiday services. Uh, he had a sort of one or two people who were employed by him whose job was simply to field such requests. And they were personal mm -hmm. in nature. You know, someone needs surgery. Someone needs help with something. And then they became, over time, institutional in nature. And they were largely surrounding promoting uh, the dignity of individuals and the dignity of communities. And dignity is, you know, when you're leaving somewhere, you need your assets, you need some money. Your dignity is you have a place to pray. Dignity is you have a place to get together with your community. Um, and dignity is also people who are not regarded as sort of fully citizens or second class citizens should have their their worth recognized. So in the 70s, when Harvard University comes to him and asks him to donate money for a building or whatever, he says, um, I will endow a chair, not just in Jewish history, but in Sephardic Jewish history, because the, you know, the world, especially in Israel, European Jewry was sort of ascendant. 
that was the dominant, that was the establishment, and people from yes. Jews from Arab worlds were sort of looked down upon as not educated, not sophisticated, not worthy of this type of consideration. And this is a guy who you know was operating at the highest levels of global finance mm -hmm. and politics, who spoke seven languages, who knew that his community was just as capable as anywhere else. And so part of his mission and his life was also to kind of elevate that world in institutional settings. It's incredibly inspiring. Um, and when, as you were writing this biography, this book, Dan, what impact did you personally want to have? Well, I guess part of, you know, the, the, the first question people often ask, uh, is you know why I did this and how I was able to get access to all this information because he was famously sort of secretive, private in his lifetime. And part of the answer is that uh, I myself, at least on my mother's side, am a Syrian Jew. My great grandparents came from Aleppo. Uh, when I my father didn't have much of a family, he was an only child. So my family growing up was my Syrian Jewish family who they basically all live even a hundred years after coming to this country. They all live in the same neighborhood in New York. They all go to the same summer place in New Jersey. They all winter in the same place in Florida. It's a very cohesive community. You know, instead of cursing in Yiddish, we curse in Arabic. We eat different foods. It's a very distinctive culture. Um, in the U.S., you know, we're a very small number of people here, maybe one or two percent of the Jewish community at large. So seen as exotic. Um, and there is a degree to which there is, I wouldn't say it's sort of suspicion of outsiders, but more of like, we're a cohesive community. Yes. Um, and so that knowing that uh, gave me both some entree into this world and also an ability to understand um, what I was looking at because the business story is there to be told. You could assemble and understand, okay, he started this bank and these were its earnings, et cetera. Sure. There are so many components of his life. Um, you know, his license plate always ended in five, 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 five is the sign of the Hamsa, which in the Middle East is a sign of good luck. He often chose to do deals on a Tuesday because in Genesis, God said, and it was good. And he saw that it was good twice yes. about Tuesday, but not of the other days. Uh, he liked to do deals on the 18th day of the month. 18th is high, the symbol of life. So there are, you know, it enables, under, you can't understand who he is without understanding what those things meant to him yes. and what it meant to be, you know, when they're, Again, I found a packing slip for their, their shipping their possessions uh, from Italy to Brazil in the 50s. Uh, so it's you know, furniture, et cetera, and then two kilograms of za'atar, which is a, you know, a spice that you put, you know, it's like a foundational spice. Like to be able to understand why someone would do that mm -hmm. when they're leaving uh, enabled me just not only the sort of intellectual entree to try to, uh, sort of build up what this was about. You know, you, before you mentioned superstition and people like to say, yes, he was superstitious. He would carry things around in his pockets and charms and he would have certain sayings. But, you know, um, one one man's custom is another one's superstition, right? People yes. say, knock on wood, is that superstition? Well, it's just, a, it's an expression, it's a phrase. It's just mm -hmm. that the phrases that he used were particular to his world and, and not particular or known to other worlds. That's brilliant, and and uh, and having yourself or going back to the business, your financial background helped. Um, so you had the whole package. No wonder you were the you anoint you were the anointed one. Um, in terms of, I always ask this question uh, on Lance for the line about you. When were you doing your best work on the book? What were the habits that you you practiced? You know, imagine your best day or your best week. Thought, I'm really on my best form. What what did you do? What can people learn from you? I don't know. I think I'm a terrible person to ask of that because my, my, I wouldn't say my approach is, you know, I've, I've written eight or nine books. I don't use a software program other than Microsoft Word. I believe in, uh, in writing the, you, you, you sort of throw your facts and ideas that you want to say, and then you start massaging it down. Like you're, uh, I don't know if it's the, the appropriate metaphor is a sculpture or clay mm. and you're molding mm. and you're shaving and you just start with like, I got all my stuff for this chapter at 60,000 words, then I start cutting, and then I start writing paragraphs. So it's not a, a method I would really 
recommend to anybody or even a method that others might recognize, but it works for me. And it means you can do it in sort of 20 minute bursts here and there. You could do it at night. You could do it over the weekend. And what it means though, is that you, you know, I don't really start with an outline for each chapter. I kind of take all the material. These are the points I want to make. These are the things that happened in this 10 year period. And then you start just cutting things out, making it coherent. And then you have moments where you say, okay, this is sort of the nut graph. This is where it should end. Yes. But you only get there by having at it. And I think that is the, um, you know, I think that is, I think you're being harsh on yourself. I think that is, I think that is brilliant. I mean, you're you're sculpting, you're sculpting something, aren't you? And you're, you're also finding moments when it feels right to do the work as opposed to many authors have, full-time jobs some some give it all up to do writing a book but the point is you have moments of well i'm really into it now let's go for 20 minutes or an hour and so forth and i think the other thing for any book is that um as much as people like to invest in writing you know it's a craft it's not a it's a trade and it's a craft and you you just sort of go do it and you write some and you write some more you finish it you get to a point where you say this has to be good enough. I'm going to show it to somebody else or put it onto somebody's plate and move on. You can't be, you know, I think you, you try to be meticulous with documenting everything, but it's important not to be precious. Yeah. That's great advice. That's great advice. Dan, thank you for sharing his story, drawing out the, the lessons, the, um, that other leaders can learn and giving a such a rich picture into it's such an inspiring individual, both in the, obviously the business community and the charitable sector and obviously in your, your community. I mean, it's absolutely wonderful. So thank you for such a stimulating, enriching conversation. Um, I've learned even more having read the book in detail. Um, where can they find out more about the book? Of course, where can they go well, online? There's a you? website about the book, a banker's It's available on Amazon. It's been, you know, reviewed, uh, written about in a fair number of publications, Financial World, uh, Hedge Magazine. I'm talking particularly about the UK now. Uh, yeah. The audio book is about to come out in another week. So people who like to Great. listen have uh, other opportunities there. And it's uh, it's been very well reviewed, uh, not surprisingly. So congratulations. And that was another edition of Lancefield on the Line. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please do check out the other episodes in the series. Subscribe to the podcast and to the YouTube channel. And do give us a, give us a nice rating along the way. And thank you again, Dan. Thank you. Thank you for having me.